Welcome! In this series of short videos, we will look at topics common to both the PowerBasic console and Windows compilers. Today we will delve again into the use of power collections within your application. This is where we left off at the end of the last power collections video. We took a small CSV file containing customer information and we imported this to a power collection. This customer's power collection we then saved to disk and then we amended the program to load that saved collection back up from disk into the power collection to be displayed and manipulated within our application. What we're going to do today is we're going to take this power collection concept one stage further. Let's have a look at the code. What we're doing at the moment is we're creating a user-defined type called customers and in that we're storing account number, first name, surname, address and telephone number. This becomes our customer record within our power collection. Each record is read in from disk and added to the collection. However, we're always storing one record per customer. What if we wanted to store more information? For example, details on the account transactions of that customer. We could, of course, store that in a completely separate collection and stored in a separate disk file. However, power collections are very flexible. And what we're going to do today, we're going to create a second user-defined type to define details of the customer's balance and transaction information. And we're going to store this within the same collection. So the first thing to do is we will create our user-defined type which defines the record for the customer. So what we're going to have, we're going to have the account number, the balance and three recent transactions on the account. Now, in order to store this within the same collection as the customer's records, we need to expand our account number slightly. So what we're going to do, rather than having a four character string for the account number, we're going to step that up and make it eight characters. And we're going to add a prefix onto the customer's records and a prefix onto the account records. And these prefixes will help us to identify which transactions belong to which type of user defined type records. So if we look at our code further down where the collection is loaded in from disk, now we're going to go back to the loading the raw file again to pull in our CSV because we're going to build a collection with this new prefix on the account number. So if we have a look at the function that does the loading of the raw file. This first of all reads the entire CSV file into an array and then for each element in the array it puts it into the user defined type. Now what we're going to do for the account number is we're going to add on the prefix. And the rest of the code is unchanged. So all we're doing is we're making the account number cell slightly bigger. So having loaded the raw file and put the data into the user defined type, the next stage then is to add the record to the collection. And once that's done, we can go back to our original code. So having loaded the raw file, we can then quite happily display the number of records. And after we've displayed the number of records, we want to add another record to our collection. Now we're populating the account number here. We want to put the prefix in, in front of the account number so we can identify it as a user record. And then we add this user divine type to the collection just as we did before. Now for this particular customer, we're going to add some transaction details as well into the accounts user defined type.
Now we're using the new user defined type for accounts, so we need to dimension it up at the top. So having dimensioned our user defined type, we can then use that variable. So we're going to put a new user defined type and populate it with the information, and we need the account prefix for that. And we're keeping the actual account number the same. The reason for the prefix is when we save the key to the collection, the key must be unique. So if we know we're searching for account number 1300, we merely have to prefix it by either the user prefix or the account prefix. And that way we will get back the appropriate record from the collection. Treating the collection almost like a database. And each prefix as a table within that database. So if we set the rest of the values, now having put that in there, we merely now have to add this particular user defined type to our collection. And we do it exactly the same way as we did previously. Only this time we're using the user defined type for accounts. And since our key is formed up of the account number from that user defined type, it already has a prefix in place. So we can quite happily go ahead and add that record to our collection. So we've now got two different types of record within the collection, one for users and one for accounts. And the rest of our code can quite happily go on. The only difference being, every time we use a key, we have to put in the appropriate prefix so that the collection will know which type of record we're either adding or removing. If we skip past the part which is actually updating the entry in the collection, our sort works just the way it did before. And now we get to the bit which we'll need to change at the end, which is reading back the data from the collection. As there are two different types of record within this collection, we'll have to work out which one we're actually dealing with in order to know what to display on the screen. This turns out to be quite straightforward. Since the data is held in a variant, and we know that the account number is the first part of that variant, we can quite happily work out what kind of record we're looking at based on the first four characters. So we'll populate that into a variable using variant dollar. Now this basically takes the whole string that is our user defined type held on a variant and populates it into record type. Now we're only interested in the first four characters of that, so we'll do a select statement. So if the first four letters are user, we know we're dealing with a user record. And if that's the case, the existing code we have here will work quite nicely for the user record. And then all we have to do is to handle the account record. So we're using a new variable here, so we'll have to declare this variable up at the top of our code. And now we put the code in for our account record. So we're using exactly the same approach as we did up here. The only difference being in this case is that we're not going to UDT customer out, we're going to UDT accounts. So we're populating the UDT accounts user defined type with the data that's coming out of our variant. And the rest of our code we will just paste in, which is using the account number from our new user defined type. And we're formatting the balances, which in this case happen to be numbers. We're using a mask to format them in a nice, easily read format. 
And just for clarity, I'm putting on a carriage return line feed at the end of each line, so that each line of this record appears on a separate line, so it's easier to read. So that handles the display of the information on the screen. After we've displayed it, we then saved to the collection. As we have two different types of UDT within that collection, we need to change our save collection routine accordingly. So if we have a look at that code, we'll create a new user-defined type for our account records. We're still opening the file for output, and just as we did before, we have to determine what kind of record we're dealing with in order to know what we're outputting. So we'll want to create our record type again. So we'll just declare that variable. So just as we did before, we're picking up the entire record from our variant, putting it into a string, and then we're working out what's in the first four characters. So the code we have in there that already exists is handled in a case statement. And we need a separate case statement for the account records. And again, the same approach is taken in that one, where we print out to the file based on the structure in the UDT accounts user-defined type. So once we've actually saved this to the file, our load routine, which is going to load our collection, will have to do exactly the same. So we'll just nip in and change that while we're at it. We'll want our new user-defined type for the account. And in here, where we're actually reading the file into a string anyway, we merely need a test based on that, using our select of the first four characters again, to work out which type of record we're actually loading up. So having determined what the first four characters are, we know if we're dealing with a customer record or an account record. So the add to the collection is done using the appropriate user-defined type. So a quick compile to see if we haven't missed anything. Yes, we've spelled that one wrong. Now we've missed the definition of that one. Oh, UDT accounts. Right, that's working fine. So we'll just try a quick run of that now. Now if we have a quick look at what we've got in here. Um, it's stored from the CSV file, our original accounts. It then reported how many records we actually had. We removed record 1200, as we did in the last video. Uh, we pulled information out at record 3 and updated it. And we have displayed on screen what we got for the account record for account 1300 with the balance and the three items, the three transactions. And then it's gone on to print off the remainder of the user transactions. As we put our power collection sort command in, it has quite naturally sorted the account 1300 before the user records. So as you'll see using this approach, you're using your power collection like a little mini database. And by varying the user-defined types you put into that database and having a sensibly named key, you can determine which user-defined type to load your data into. So the final change to make will be rather than to load from the CSV file, will be to load from the collection itself. which proves that we have not only created the collection on disk, but we can read from it as well. And there we have it. It will quite naturally report that it cannot remove user 1200, 
because user 1200 was already removed in the last run. So there's our data. So this certainly illustrates how flexible power collections actually are. That's it for today. Thank you for watching.